As those of you who have been around United for a while know, we plan worship several weeks and sometimes even months in advance. Some of that is to begin to get the scripture passages and the themes for the day inside us so that we know what to sing, what to pray, what to play, what to offer in sermons. We also do that because we have a thing called the newsletter deadline, which comes at least, it feels like, 10 months ahead of that particular, the month that's supposed to be printed. But for September, the newsletter deadline was August 10th, just a mere four or five weeks ago. But nonetheless, it meant that things had to get planned and ready to go by that deadline. And so this service for September 1st, which is the Sunday this year right before Labor Day, was all planned, at least in my head, at the beginning of August. Because it is our tradition here at United on Labor Day that we take time to give thanks for the gift of work. And we hear from different people in the congregation, either uh, through their own witness or through the words they give to me to share about how it is they experience God's presence in their work, the great creator God. Whether that work is paid or volunteer, whether it is in the home or in an office or a clinic or a school or wherever work may be. And so indeed, this service was all planned several weeks ago. But on Monday of this week, when I, perhaps like you, began to see the pictures of the Amazon in flames, when I, perhaps like you, read and heard about the issues with lead in the water of Newark, New Jersey, when I read and heard, perhaps like you, the threat of the new hurricane and the fact that the hurricane season is longer and more violent than it has been in other years. When I read about the rollback of methane regulations and know that I serve a church that is in the shadow of that methane because the Four Corners area of this country has the worst methane cloud hanging over it of any part of this whole world. And when perhaps like you, I read about yet one more assault on the Environmental Protection Agency and also the rollback of endangered status for 500 species of animals, birds, lizards, plants of God's good creation. And all of that coming together, and I realized that this service would have to be focused on the works of God, the work of creation. Because as people of God, we believe not just in God the creator, the one who set it all in motion billions of years ago, but as we sing oftentimes, we believe in creating God, whose fingers trace the bold designs of farthest space whose sun and moon and planet Earth are all part of that creation, who is not over and done with this Earth, but yearns to continue to create it as an abundant place of life for all. That's God's work. And that's what I invite us to focus on this day in worship. And so we began the service with Songs that we oftentimes begin with, singing about the abundance of life, all creatures, great and small, singing to the God of all creation. For those of you who might be new to United or visiting just for today, we sing a lot about the beauty of all creation, that circle of life that God draws us into. We use the song of our opening hymn, that, which is based on the prayer of St. Francis to Brother Sun and Sister Moon, Sister Earth and Brother Water and all the wonderful things of creation. We incorporate the wisdom of our Hispanic, Catholic, and Native American brothers and sisters in our prayers that look to the four directions of this earth and give thanks for it all. Blue sky and brown dirt and all the things that crawl and creep and fly and swim and the abundance of this world. We give thanks for it all. But today... Today, I invite you to hear a different scripture passage, not from Genesis, not from the Psalms, but from a prophet. 
Because when I read those accounts of the Amazon and when I learned about the methane rollback and all those things, I knew that we couldn't have the same service I'd planned out. I knew that I had to go back to the drawing board and in, as a preacher had to go back to the lectionary. What are the lessons for today, the scripture lessons that are being shared up the street at Christ Lutheran and down the street at St. Bede's and over at Santa Maria and over at the cathedral and here at United. And the Hebrew Bible scripture passage for the day is from the prophet Jeremiah. Now, I don't know about you, but when I usually think of the prophets, I usually think of them having to do with justice issues for human beings, taking care of the poor and the oppressed and the disenfranchised. But you know what? Those Hebrew prophets, 3,000 years ago almost, they cared as much for this good earth. And their prophecies and their concern for getting the people back into right relationship was not only right relationship with God the Creator, but the right relationship with God's creation, this planet Earth. And so in the very second chapter of Jeremiah, a prophet who is speaking to the people of Israel in a time of exile, when they have been hauled off from their homeland, from everything that they knew from the good earth where they had had their lives. There Jeremiah is preaching not only about how do they care for one another and how are they in right relationship with God, but Jeremiah is lamenting, lamenting the relationship they have with this earth. And so my brothers and sisters, I pray that we might have the courage on this day when this Hebrew Bible passage shows up in churches all around this world, that we might be open to this very, very hard word. But in our openness, we might be given life and the courage to be about that life for this world. Let our hearts and our lives be opened to this lament of the Creator. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, What wrong did your ancestors find in me that they went far from me and went after worthless things and became worthless themselves? They did not say, Where is the Lord who brought us up from the land of Egypt, who led us in the wilderness, in a land of deserts and pits? in a land of drought and deep darkness, in a land that no one passes through, where no one lives. I brought you into a plentiful land to eat its fruits and its good things. But when you entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. The priests did not say, where is the Lord? Those who handle the law did not know me. The rulers transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and went after things that do not profit. Therefore, once more, I accuse you, says the Lord, and I accuse your children's children. Cross to the coasts of Cyprus and look. Send to Kedar and examine with care. See if there has ever been such a thing. Has a nation changed its gods even though they are no gods? But my people have changed their glory for something that does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked. Be utterly desolate, says the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me the fountain of living water, and dug out cisterns for themselves, cracked cisterns that can hold no water. The word of God, the word of life. Let us be together in prayer. Let us pray. Indeed, we pray to you, O Lord. We pray to you for this good earth, and we pray for ourselves that you would open up our hearts, our minds, and our souls, and let an ancient word spoken by a prophet long ago and far away go deep into our lives. 
and let your powerful spirit present among us go deep as well. And may that word and spirit together transform our lives. Give us the courage we need. Give us the hope we need. And give us the love we need to care for and love this earth as you so love. We pray in your name. Amen. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. What wrong did your ancestors find in me that they went far from me and went after worthless things and became worthless themselves? They did not say, Where is the Lord who brought us up from the land of Egypt, who led us in the wilderness, in a land of deserts and pits, in a land of drought and deep darkness, in a land that no one passes through, where no one lives? I brought you into a plentiful land to eat its fruits and its good things. Each one of us has taken that journey. And I don't mean necessarily moving from the east coast or the west coast to the middle of the country to Santa Fe to a beautiful land. But each one of us has taken that journey because God has called us out of the darkness of our creation, out of the womb of God's being, and breathed into us the very breath of life and set us wherever we were born, wherever we were born, set us in this good earth. An earth that God created with blue sky and fertile ground, with a multitude of creatures, with the earth that gives up its seed and its plants, in the monks, animals of all kinds, the journey that Jeremiah describes is not just the journey of the Hebrew people going through the wilderness of Sinai finally to get to what they considered the promised land. Nor is it the journey that any one of us took perhaps if we moved from one place to another. But it is the very journey of our lives. Being born into this world. Being born onto this planet of blue sky and good water and good brown dirt. Jeremiah reminds the people of Israel, but 3,000 years later, he also reminds us what we have inherited, where we were born regardless of the actual location, born into this planet. But then the prophet goes on and says to the people and says to us, I brought you into a plentiful land to eat its fruits and its good things. But when you entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. Whew. Now I have to admit, Abomination is not a word I use every day. <laughs> and in our country and in our culture, it is a, a word that is sometimes used by some branches of the Christian church to refer to one thing and one thing only, homosexuality. But that's not how it's used here. And in fact, it's not used that way in any place having to do with homosexuality. And so the next time somebody says to you, in the name of Jesus Christ, a same gender relationship is somehow, quote, an abomination, I hope that you will do some good biblical work with them. <laughs> <laughs> Refer them to the second chapter of the prophet Jeremiah and remind them that abomination has to do with how we have defiled this planet Earth that God has given us. That's the true abomination. And if by any chance you happen to read something in the paper or online, take time to write, to write a letter to the editor, a post, and do some good biblical work 
about the second chapter of the ancient prophet Jeremiah, about what a true abomination is. And it doesn't have to do with sexuality. It has to do with how we relate to this incredible planet and all that dwells therein, of which we are a part. And notice that uh, Jeremiah doesn't let anybody off the hook. <laughs> the priest did not say, where is the Lord? Those who handle the law did not know me. The rulers transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and went after things that do not profit. Religious leaders, political leaders, titans of economics and finance, none of us get off clean on this one. And notice, too, that Jeremiah, throughout this passage, keeps coming back to the issue of economics. Not only here, but a little bit later in the passage, he talks about, he says, But my people have changed their glory for something that does not profit. Lord Almighty, if you look at the history of this country and the history of our relationship with fossil fuels over the last 50 years, you will find that the only, the, the, one of the primary reasons we are engaged in this climate crisis is for the sheer profit of it all. That there was a conscious attempt and success to a large degree over the last five decades to make sure that climate change was seen as a hoax, to make sure that climate change and what we do to contribute to carbon in this atmosphere was somehow not scientific. And we are paying the price for that now, and so will our children and our children's children. In the 1990s, President George H.W. Bush wanted to work with Congress, and Congress was behind it, to, do, to develop a carbon tax that would have slowed down this turbo train that we're on of pumping carbon into this air. But instead, economic powers came to pass that made sure that Bush did not do that and that any moderate of any party who talked about climate change was discredited. Read the history. Read the history. And we have changed this glorious planet, clean air and beautiful sky and good water and good earth and beautiful oceans. We've changed all of that glory simply for profit. Before we get to have a chance to praise God for all the glory of creation, my brothers and sisters, sometimes we have to lament. Sometimes we have to know what it is that we have lost, and we also have to take responsibility and hold those in power responsibility, responsible for what has been lost. It is not any different than when we do a funeral or memorial service. We always take time to know the journey to that day, to acknowledge that our loved one has died. Because you've got to do that before you can get to the celebration. In the current state of this planet, we need Jeremiah's lament from almost 3,000 years ago. Yes, we need the joy and the rejoicing and loving this creation as we seek to do in this congregation and as our faith calls us to do, but sometimes we also have to just take time and lament. And the prophet calls us to that. Because until we do that, we don't take responsibility. And we can't be open to God's healing power and presence, even in the midst of the brokenness. We have changed our glory. We have changed the glory of this planet that God has given us and sold our inheritance for a mess of pottage. It's right in there. It's part of our biblical faith. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked, be utterly desolate. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and dug out cisterns for themselves, 
cracked cisterns that can hold no water. Jeremiah holds the people accountable for turning away and desecrating the very waters of life and then building structures, cisterns, systems, ways of life that don't give life, that run out just like a cracked cistern. That's part of our biblical heritage, my friends. And I appreciate your willingness to engage this very difficult text. And I appreciate your commitment to trying to love this world as God loves it, even now, especially now. And so indeed, let us pray. Let us pray to give thanks for the glory and beauty of this incredible created world still. For the blue sky, for the soft summer winds, for those little things, those little plants that our children are helping to grow, for the good fertilizer they're spreading around the plants today, for the miracle of every breath of life, every drink of water, for the vastness of the ocean and the creativity of the creator who would create both a snail and an elephant and everything in between. Let us praise God and give thanks for all of that. And let us also be honest about the need to lament and the need to repent, to hold ourselves and our leaders accountable for this earth and to pray every single day for planet Earth and all that dwells therein. I will commit to doing that. I hope you will too. Thanks be to God.